talk about the dog aging project. So anytime. If, <laughs> if you could uh, like quickly introduce the project. Uh, we did talk about it before, but uh, yeah. people may, may not be familiar with it. And just uh, some of the preliminary results that you're seeing. Yeah, sure. So the, do the dog aging project is um, what we call a, a longitudinal study of aging. And all that really means is we are following individuals, in this case, individual pet dogs living with their owners over time and measuring things and trying to understand what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence health outcomes during aging. And so the kinds of things we're measuring are owner reported survey information, we're sequencing genomes of a subset of dogs. We're collecting data from blood. So blood chemistry, blood amylite, uh, analytes, metabolome, microbiome, epigenome. So we're, we're collecting both biological samples from a subset of dogs and then a whole pretty extensive uh, owner survey based data set. And then also uh, electronic veterinary medical records from the dogs. Um, and again, these are all pet dogs, what we call companion dogs living with their owners. So they're living in the real world, sharing the human environment. Um, we have about 45,000, actually it's more than that now, more than 45,000 dogs, uh, all in the United States in the study. Um, they're in the largest set is what we call the dog aging project pack. And every year we collect new biological samples from the dogs that are being sampled and new survey data from the owners. Um, uh, and that's what, that's what makes it longitudinal because we're collecting data on the same dogs over time. And, you know, as you can appreciate dogs age about seven to 10 times faster than people do. So over five years, 10 years, 15 years, we'll end up having a longitudinal study of aging in dogs across the dog's entire lifespans. So that would take 70 years in people we can do the same thing in a decade in dogs. So that's one of the powerful features of doing this in dogs. And as I said, the goal is to understand what are the most important genetic and environmental factors that influence health during aging in dogs. So lifespan is one of the things we're interested in, but obviously there's a whole bunch of health measures, including disease incidence, cognitive function, muscle function, uh, cardiovascular function that we're also interested in and understanding what, are, what, what factors impact those. Um, the other piece of the dog aging project uh, that's a little bit distinct, although um, you know it's all under the, the umbrella of the same project is a rapamycin clinical trial. So we have a double blind placebo controlled randomized uh, clinical trial. About 580 dogs will eventually be enrolled in the trial to assess does rapamycin increase lifespan in dogs. So lifespan is the primary endpoint of that trial. And then as secondary endpoints, we're looking at multiple health span metrics. So things like heart function by echocardiogram, neurological function by neurological exam, cognitive function, activity monitoring, uh, liver function, kidney function by, by blood chemistry. Then as exploratory endpoints, metabolome, microbiome, epigenome, things like that. So we're really trying to understand as much as we can how is rapamycin impacting health span? And I, and I use that word carefully because like health span is a concept. It's not something we can measure. Um, how is rapamycin impacting health span in dogs by measuring multiple health span metrics, multiple specific things that we think are associated with health in dogs. Um, so that study is still actively enrolling. Um, it's a three year, three years. So the dogs are in the study for three years, start to finish, one year treatment, two year follow-up. Once all of the dogs have completed the three years will unblind and then we'll be able to assess does rapamycin increase lifespan in dogs. And then, so that'd be the primary thing we look at. And then we'll look at the secondary endpoints after that. Interesting. So when do you expect that? To, so you're still enrolling. So it's got to be at least three years. Yeah. Out. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been frustrating. I know I've been talking about the trial for a long time. I think, you know, like, like many big trials, we, um, we were victims of COVID-19, the, the mm -hmm. veterinary clinics all shut down for everything except emergency visits. So yeah, so we're still enrolling, you know, optimistically, I think um, we are shooting for all of the dogs being in the trial within the next 12 months. So randomized it in the trial, and then it'll be three years from that. So it might, it, it, we might, we might be able to do an interim analysis before that, uh, to determine, you know, again, the way these clinical trials are done, so they stay blinded, but you can do something called an interim analysis where the statistician can be unblinded and assess whether or not the intervention is working. And we are going to do an interim analysis. It, you know, it would have to be a pretty big effect size for us to be able to say 
with confidence at that point that the intervention is having a positive effect. Um, but that can happen in an interim analysis. And this is a little bit of a different kind of clinical trial, but if this was like a cancer trial, one of the reasons you would do an interim analysis is because if the intervention, if the treatment is working, you want to know that because it would be unethical to keep the people who aren't getting the treatment off of the treatment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and sometimes trials can be unblinded early if the intervention is working uh, and you can, you can tell that by the interim analysis. So, you know, we'll see, but realistically, I think we're probably four years out, which is frustrating, but you know, it is what it is. That's how long it takes to do these things in the context of of, of uh, the real world sometimes. And you're still accepting new dogs at the moment. Is it still US only, continental US only? Yes. So the dog aging project is US only. And for the rapamycin clinical trial, part of the challenge has been that the owners have to bring their dogs to one of our partner clinical sites. And we have, we've expanded that now to almost 20. We, we had nine originally, and now we've, we've bumped it up to almost 20. But so there is a little bit of an even more geographic constraint mm -hmm. in that owners have to live close enough to one of the clinical sites that they're willing to come twice a year for that three-year period uh, for, for the exams. Um, so, so yes, we are still recruiting uh, and all the dogs have to be in the United States. Um, the other, the other, uh, Entrance criteria are the dogs have to be at least seven years old and between 40 and 110 pounds. Um, and, and those are because that's the demographic we need to have our statistical power to see an effect on lifespan.